Unit 2, Celestial Mechanics. Lecture 2.1, Kepler's Laws of Planetary Motion. In the early 1600s, a German mathematician determined that planets orbit the sun in elliptical orbits before the invention of the telescope, before the invention of physics, and before the invention of calculus. All Kepler had to go on was the visual position of different planets against the background stars. Here's an example of the path of Mars against the background stars in 2016. The dots are the position of Mars taken every five days. So as time progresses, uh, Mars marches along the, the sky it slows its position and then reverses its direction. We'll see it reverses its direction again and then keeps on going. So just from this data or these observations alone, it certainly isn't clear that Mars is an elliptical orbit around the sun. But by, but by making very precise uh, model calculations of different planet, possible planetary orbits, Kepler showed that the only way of explaining that motion of, of Mars against the background stars was if it followed an elliptical orbit. So uh, Kepler developed three laws of motion, uh, the first of which uh, says that the planet's orbit in elliptical orbits uh, in 1609. He worked on this for at least eight years before he came uh, to a conclusion. This was a year before um, the event invention of the telescope and Galileo's first observations of the night sky with a telescope. So again, this preceded uh, uh, telescopic observations, which is pretty amazing. Just for historical context, um, it's also interesting to think that Descartes uh, was coming up with this idea that there that the universe is governed by a universal set of physical laws, and so those ideas weren't forming until a good, um, you know, thirty or forty years after Kepler's observations. It wasn't until much later, um, in the late sixteen hundreds that Newton took Kepler's discovery that planets orbit the sun in elliptical orbits and from that observation deduced Newton's now famous three laws of motion. So F equals MA uh, was actually an invention used to describe Kepler's observations. So. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to define Kepler's three laws, um, and then in subsequent lectures, we'll talk about how to derive those laws from Newtonian mechanics. Kepler's first law says that planets travel in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus. So here's a sketch of an elliptical orbit with a planet on it. The sun is at one focus. At the other focus is just empty space. So let's define a few properties of an ellipse. Uh, let's put a little uh, plus sign at the center of the ellipse. The distance from the center out to the um, long edge of the ellipse is called the semi-major axis. It's usually given by the letter A. Um, if you look at the the complete diameter or distance across the ellipse, that would be 2a. The distance from the center out to the short side of the ellipse is called the semi-minor axis, b. And so the total distance across the short, uh, the short width of the ellipse is uh, 2b. Uh, and then the eccentricity, e, uh, is a measure of like how squashed the ellipse is. So it's defined as uh, e squared, that is the eccentricity squared is 1 minus b squared over a squared.
So here are some examples. So an ellipse with an eccentricity zero is just a, a perfect circle. As the um, eccentricity increases to one, the, um, the ellipse gets more and more flattened out. So again, remember that the eccentricity is one minus b squared over a squared. So if in a perfect circle, b equals a, if b equals a here, you get one minus one and then you just get zero. As b gets smaller and smaller, as it gets more squished, uh, this goes to zero, this term goes to zero, and then e squared just equals one. Let's look at um, the eccentricities of planets in our solar system. So this table is in the back of your textbook. It's in Appendix A. So uh, the planets, Mercury through Neptune, are listed back there, and their orbital eccentricities are given in this column. So, um, so the Earth has a very small eccentricity, 0 0.016, so it's very nearly a nice circular orbit. Mercury is the most eccentric, having an eccentricity of 0.2, so it's the most squashed. Uh, your book also lists uh, the dwarf planet, so if you remember a few years back, Pluto was demoted being a, a dwarf planet, and then there are these other series, Humea, Makimaki, and Eris, um, and you can see their properties. This table also includes the uh, semi-major axis of the different uh, planets in units of astronomical units, which is the average distance from the Earth to the Sun. So by definition, the Earth is, the semi-major axis of the Earth is one. And so you can see Mercury is about a third of that. Neptune is about 30 times that. And a lot of these dwarf planets are even farther out in the solar system. Um, okay. So let's write down the mathematical form of an ellipse in a couple of different ways. Uh, if we use Cartesian coordinates, so if you measure the X and Y coordinates of a planet as it goes around um, the center, uh, you could find an ellipse this way, x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. Remember again, a is a semi-major axis, b is a semi-minor axis. Um, it turns out this is not a particularly useful way of describing an ellipse, even though it might be the one that you're most familiar with. A more useful description is to use polar coordinates. So in the previous example, the center of the ellipse was at the origin. Uh, when we write uh, the path of an ellipse in polar coordinates, it's, it's most convenient to place one focus um, at the origin. So we're, we've shifted the ellipse over. We're going to place the sun, uh, say, at the origin, and then this equation will describe the distance the planet is from the sun as a function of theta. That is, as a function of the angle as the planet uh, orbits around the sun. So you can see that this expression depends on the eccentricity and the semi-major axis, and of course on that angle theta. So here's an example. Um, let's calculate the distance the planet is from the sun at its closest point. So this uh, closest approach is called a uh, perihelion. Um, and so we want to find that distance based on the previous um, uh, formula. So in polar coordinates, the perihelion occurs when that angle theta is equal to zero degrees by definition. So we'll define that distance as rp, again p for perihelion, r is the radial distance of the, of the planet to the sun. And so the perihelion distance is, the, uh, is that radial coordinate evaluated at theta equals zero degrees. So all we have to do is plug in theta equals zero into our formula here to get the result. Cosine of theta is just one. So we get a times 1 minus e squared over just 1 plus e. We can simplify this uh, fraction 
by expanding the, the top. Uh, 1 minus e squared is just 1 minus e times 1 plus e. The 1 plus e's cancel out. And we get a very simple result that the perihelion distance is the semi-major axis times 1 minus the eccentricity. So as a homework problem, uh, you want to show that the farthest a planet can get from the sun is the semi-major axis times 1 plus e instead of 1 minus e. So it's just fun. It's just following the previous uh, calculation on the previous slide, uh, but now you want to um, evaluate it at an angle theta of 180 degrees instead of zero degrees. So here's again just a summary. Again, the point of closest approach is called perihelion. That distance is given by a times one minus e. The point where the planet is farthest from the sun is called aphelion and that's a times 1 plus e. These expressions we'll use over and over uh, in this unit. So it's kind of interesting. Um, those points of closest approach and farthest approach are called perihelion and aphelion if an object is orbiting the sun. If an object is orbiting the Earth, uh, you call those perigee and apogee. If it's orbiting um, another star, like an exoplanet is orbiting a different star. It's called periastron and apoastron. If you've got a, a galaxy, if you've got a, a star orbiting a galaxy, such as our solar systems going around the center of our galaxy, when we're closest to the center of the galaxy, that's called paragalacticon. And when we are farthest, it's called apogalacticon. Um, your book uses a more kind of generic term they, uh, they use the term pericenter and apocenter. That just is a generic name for it doesn't matter what object you're going around, you can call it that. Another term is periapsis and apoapsis. Anyway, there's a million different um, names for these points. Uh, in our solar system, we'll be using perihelion and aphelion, but just be aware that this other terminology is out there. Okay. Uh, let's do another uh, quick example. Let's try to find the distance of the sun or one of the foci to the center of the ellipse. So this is a pretty simple calculation given our previous result. That distance from the center out to the focus is just a times e. Very simple result. Here, this diagram shows kind of everything we've derived so far. It's got the perihelion distance, the aphelion distance, and then how far the foci out are out from the center of the ellipse. Okay, so that um, gives a, a, a few mathematical results about defining an ellipse so that we can describe that elliptical path of a planet around the sun. Um, Kepler's second law says that a line drawn from the sun to a planet sweeps out equal areas at equal time intervals. So what that means is that basically the velocity of a planet changes as it swings around its elliptical orbit and the way that it changes its speed follows this law. So if you've got a planet that's near aphelion, the farthest it is from the sun, um, and you and you let the planet uh, go for, say, a month, and you see how far it goes, then it's the planet will kind of trace out this uh, kind of pie-shaped uh, shape. Um, when it comes in and swings closer to the sun, the area after one month here is going to be the same as the area here, because the planet is now closer to the sun, it's got to move faster to, to trace out a farther distance along the arc to have this area match that area. So that means that it's got to speed up when it comes in closer to the sun and slow down when it's farther away. So here's a little animation. So there's our planet. 
It's swinging out, it's going slower out there, now faster and closer. And so Kepler's second law shows exactly how the, the planet speeds up as it falls in closer to the sun and then slows down as it pulls farther away. As we'll see um, in the next lecture, this is actually the same as saying that angular momentum of the planet is conserved. So we'll, we'll prove that um, this is just a direct consequence of conservation of angular momentum. Finally, Kepler's third law uh, relates the periods and semi-major axes of different planets in the solar system. So it says that the squares of the orbital periods P of the planets are proportional to the cubes of the semi-major axis of their orbits. So just that P squared is proportional to A cubed. Sidereal, remember, that just means um, measured in an inertial reference frame, not relative to a rotating reference frame. So again, P is going to be the period which we'll measure in years. A is a semi-major axis measured in astronomical units. And K is just defined as one year squared per astronomical unit cubed. So you can just think of K as equal to one if P and A have these units. And again, an astronomical unit is the semi-major axis of the Earth's orbit around the sun. That works out to about 150 million kilometers, or 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters. So let's go back and look at um, the table in the back of your book. Um, it also lists over here the, uh, well, it lists, the, there's the semi-major axis that we talked about before, and it also lists the uh, orbital period in years. So let's look at the Earth. By definition, uh, the semi-major axis is just one AU, and it also has a period of one year, by definition. So here, this is trivially satisfied. P squared is one, A squared is one, one equals one, so Kepler's third law holds. Let's try a different planet. Let's try Jupiter. Um, so the period is 11.86. Um, so if we square that, you get 140.7. The semi-major axis is 5.2 astronomical units. You cube that number, you get 140.6. So within the errors, uh, the significant figures of the data that were given, uh, these are in agreement. So, so this kind of um, just this example just shows that Kepler's third law at least works for Jupiter. It's interesting if you take the data in the previous um, table and then plot it on a log log plot, you get this nice result that all of the planets uh, line up on a line. So here's Kepler's third law it says that p squared is this constant k times a cubed. We're going to, if, if we want to plot it on a log log plot, we're going to take the log of each side of this equation. So if you take the log of p squared and then the log of ka cubed, um, we can, remember you can pull out the exponent here, that, that p squared, the, the two up here comes out in front. Uh, when you take the log of the product of k times a cubed, that you separate them out like that. So you have the log of that constant k plus 3 log a. And now if you just divide through by the 2, you get that the log of the period is 1 half log of k plus 3 halves log of a. So now if we plot this on a log log plot, basically what it means is that Instead of plotting the period on the vertical axis, we're going to plot the log of the period. So this will be what we're plotting on the y-axis. On the x-axis, we're plotting the log of the semi-major axis, A. And we can see that there's a linear relationship now between y and x. So this constant here is just an overall y-offset. So that's just a vertical shift. And then the slope of the line is just going to be 3 halves. 
So you can write this expression as y is equal to a constant plus 3 halves x. So this is just the equation of a line. Um, this is a general result. So if whenever you have a power law, meaning if you have one thing is equal to another variable to some power, and you plot a power log, a power law on a log log plot, it always comes out as a straight line. There are tons of power laws in astronomy, which we'll see. And so uh, this is a good trick, and we'll use this um, many times in this course. So the reason that this is useful is that you can take all the data, you can plot the periods and the semi-major axes of all the planets, and you, if you, you see that they line up in a line like that, you know that there's a power law relationship between their periods and semi-major axes. And by, by if you look, if you can measure the slope of this line, that would give you this, um, you, this would give you what that power law relationship is. So basically, the fact that that's a 3 halves power, it means that the period goes as the semi-major axis to the 3 halves power. This constant here, we'll see in the next lecture, depends on the mass of the object that the planets are orbiting around. So if you look at uh, period and semi-major axis data for the moons of Jupiter, uh, here are four of the moons of Jupiter plotted. They also follow a, a power law relationship with the same slope, but you see that they, they fall on a different line that's been shifted vertically, and that's because Jupiter has a much smaller mass than the Sun. So uh, this relationship is going to be vertically shifted compared to planets orbiting the Sun. And again, we'll show this in the next lecture. Okay, so uh, we've introduced a number of equations and uh, new definitions. This just summarizes um, our definitions of the eclipse uh, of the ellipse. We have the equation of the ellipse in both um, Cartesian and polar coordinates, and then uh, this is Kepler's uh, third third law over here. So just a summary of what we covered. So that's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we'll introduce some basic ideas underlying uh, Newtonian physics and introduce uh, polar coordinate systems in a little bit more detail.